Welcome to Boring Topics. Today, Nintendo is an integral part of many living rooms across America. Their newest console, the Switch, has enjoyed great success and sold more than 52 million units at the time of this video, making the Switch Nintendo's third best-selling console of all time, behind only the original NES and the Wii. Its unique form factor and strong game lineup have won many fans and erased the failure of the previous Nintendo console, the poorly received Wii U. Nintendo is once again seen as an innovative company that delivers a phenomenal gaming experience, taking chances on innovative form factors and technology in order to deliver a unique gaming experience. This isn't the first time Nintendo has fought its way to the top against the odds. Its entire history as a gaming company is one of turbulent ups and downs, but Nintendo's business practices have never been anything other than unique and its drive for success anything other than extraordinary. In nowhere is that better demonstrated than in Nintendo's successful entrance into the North American market. Nintendo's entrance into the United States faced a crisis at the start. Their Space Invaders knockoff arcade game, Radar Scope, sold poorly, leaving them with 2,000 unsold arcade cabinets. Sitting in a dusty warehouse, Minura Arkawa, son-in-law to the Nintendo CEO, faced a crisis that threatened the future of the company. To understand how Nintendo got from that dusty warehouse all the way to complete domination of the home video game industry just five years later, we need to step back over a century to Nintendo's origins and how their business practices were shaped through over a hundred years of hard work and careful attention to detail. Nintendo didn't start off as a home console maker or an arcade game creator, but rather has a long history stretching back to the 19th century. Founded in 1889 by Fushiro Yamochi, Nintendo can be translated as leave luck to heaven. Over time, the business was built up very extensively, with Nintendo even striking a deal with Disney in 1956 to release playing cards with various Disney characters on them. The deal with Disney was an enormous success that led to considerably increased revenues and helped the younger generation of Japanese youth get familiar with the Nintendo name. However, they were never satisfied to just coast along with their existing playing card business, and under the founder's grandson, Hiroshi, the company was renamed to just Nintendo in 1963, dropping the playing card from the name in order to better reflect their newly varied business interests. They then tried running a taxi company, a TV network, and even sold their own brand of instant rice. These and other ventures were occasionally moderately successful, but never turned into a long-term sustainable business. That finally began to change, however, when Nintendo began to move into the toy business, although they never quit making playing cards and still do to this day. A young Nintendo engineer named Gunpei Yoki created Nintendo's first toy product in 1966 called the Ultra Hand. This was a modest success, and Nintendo was able to build off this and introduce a few other toys that did well for a while. But by the early 1970s, Nintendo had fallen behind the toy market and shifted his focus yet again. This time Hiroshi decided to move into the arcade business, and in 1973 established a subsidiary of Nintendo called Nintendo Leisure System to create arcade games. At this point, Nintendo's focus was still solely the Japanese market, but their arcade business produced several modest successes such as Wild Gunman and Battleshock. These smaller successes were enough to keep Hiroshi committed to developing the arcade business further. Nintendo even branched out a bit into a couple very early home consoles, most significantly the Color TV Game 6. This was an orange box that hooked up to a standard TV and could play six marginally different versions of what was optimistically called tennis, but was really just six variations of Pong. It sold over a million units after its release in 1977, but overall was a money loser due to the enormous R&D costs that Nintendo had incurred while developing it. Nintendo did get a big winner, however, with the 1979 release of the Game & Watch, a very basic handheld gaming line, each of which had one built-in game whose dual screen layout would resurface several decades later with the Nintendo DS. Nintendo entered the U.S. arcade market in 1980 with a Space Invaders clone called Raiderscope. The president of Nintendo sent his son-in-law, Minura Arkawa, to America with 3,000 Raiderscope cabinets. Business was slow at first, and Arkawa was only able to sell a third of the inventory. With 2,000 unsold cabinets getting dust, Arkawa had a brilliant masterstroke. Instead of scrapping the units and likely leaving the U.S. market, he would create a new game that could be loaded into unsold units. That, plus some new decals for the sides, would create a brand new arcade game that they could then attempt to sell. 
Yamochi agreed to this plan and gave the task of implementing it to a young staff artist named Sugiro Miyamoto. Miyamoto's task was a difficult one. He had to create a game that would work with the existing hardware controls as new buttons and hardware could not be added to the existing units, only the software could change. He decided that instead of cranking out yet another derivative space combat clone, he would go in a different direction, an original one. The game he created, Donkey Kong, took inspiration from both King Kong and Popeye, but was its own distinct creation. In a basic but very serviceable plot, Mario had to rescue his girlfriend from the clutches of an angry ape, Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong went on to be the best-selling arcade game of all time, selling over 120,000 cabinets. By the 1980s, arcades were popular gathering spots for young people who eagerly fed quarters into a wide variety of arcade games. This success had fueled some attempts to make ports of popular arcade games for early home consoles. Pac-Man in particular was generating enormous profits for Japanese publisher Namco in the arcades and had been ported to the Atari 2600 in 1982, where it sold a respectable 7 million units at $37.95 a piece. If Nintendo could get a foothold in the home, an entirely new and potentially very lucrative market would open up. Nintendo had seen how successful Atari had been with the 2600, and had even done some development work on the system, porting its arcade Mario Brothers hit to the aging Atari 2600 in 1983. In the process, they learned a bit about how the home console market worked. But there was still the major challenge they faced in that 1983, the North American home video game market had collapsed, attracting almost 93% as previously mentioned. The Vectrix, ColecoVision, and Fairchild F were among the many video game consoles that got off the market. The Atari 2600 was floundering, and basically on life support with the successor console, the Atari 5200, being discontinued in 1984 after a mere two years in the market. According to one source, out of well over a hundred video game companies considered significant players in 1982, only about half a dozen survived into 1985. Retailers and consumers alike were uninterested in what they considered a dead category. The conventional wisdom was that gaming in the US would be focused on the home computer market, a system that offered more practical utility than just gaming. Retailers were especially wary of taking a chance on video game systems, given the losses they had sustained from units they had been unable to sell. There were several causes of the market collapse, and it wasn't solely due to the relatively poor graphics home consoles offered when compared to their arcade cousins. The much bigger problem was the rampant proliferation of games with poor quality control and shoddy design. Matters were not helped by a market that was saturated with new gaming consoles fighting with the Atari 2600. In 1983, there were no fewer than eight separate companies fighting for market share and crucial shelf space for their consoles. The quality of games that poured out into store shelves varied wildly. For every genre creating hit like Pong, there were many awful ones like E.T. A tidal wave of unauthorized third-party developers flooded the market with poor games, frequently developed in a matter of weeks by a single developer with no testing or quality assurance. Speaking of E.T., the single developer responsible for its deployment, Howard Warshaw, was given a mere five and a half weeks to take the game from inception to release. Under those conditions, it was remarkable that it was even a playable game at all. The game that kicked off the home console market, Pong, was already past its prime in the early 1980s. Sears had been able to sell a Pong-only console for $98.95 back in 1975, or about $476 today. However, by the 1980s, consumers had become far more selective in their entertainment tastes. The market was increasingly unwilling to accept poor or limited experiences based around a couple variants of Pong. Rather, they wanted game consoles with the ability to play more than a couple built-in games. Thanks to the market that quickly grew to over half a dozen competing game consoles, the third-party software market exploded in size. Games were just pushed out into the market, with one of Atari's executives, Michael Hannigan, reportedly saying that he could crap in a box and sell a million copies. Systems like the Atari 2600 had no security in place to prevent unauthorized cartridges from being played on it. The relatively simplistic graphics and capabilities of the 2600 allowed for a very low bar to enter, with commercial game releases seeing development times of only a matter of weeks, all from a single developer. The result was a flood of low-quality, unauthorized games in the market as companies rushed to get games onto store shelves no matter their quality or lack thereof. Poor quality games like Disaster, Coconuts, and Amidar had both poor graphics and dull gameplay. 
Other problems were high-profile failures of ports from the arcade games to the weak console hardware of the day, such as the abysmal Pac-Man Atari 2600 port, rated by Next Generation Gaming Magazine as the worst coin-op conversion of all time. Faced with a barrage of competing systems and slowly moving merchandise, the retailers threw up their hands and caused a major crisis in the console world by trying to return merchandise. The console companies did not have the cash to refund the retailers. This led to brutal discounting where systems were sold below cost and games plunged from $40 down to $5 and even lower. This console crash left a scorched market with furious retailers and unhappy customers. Nintendo would have to carefully enter the market and deploy a variety of tactics to overcome the challenge. They could see that the only dedicated gaming machines seeing success in the North American market were the arcade cabinets. With their advanced graphics and technically impressive games, but arcade cabinets were able to do this by using custom hardware and software that was specific to each game with the whole system costing thousands of dollars. These graphics and gameplay were not possible on even the most powerful home consoles of the day, most of which, like the 2600, have been designed in the 1970s and were capable of only the most primitive graphics by 1980 standards. Yamuchi and the head of Nintendo's research and development division, Mashiaki Yumera, put their heads together and worked out what features their machine would need to have in order to rectify the disadvantages that Nintendo had observed with other home consoles. The goal would be to create something that could be introduced into the Japanese market first and then possibly expand it if it did well. They eventually decided that their new machine would need the following characteristics. First of all, it would need to be affordable. Yamuchi set a price target of around $75 or 9,800 yen. However, for this price, it would still need to beat the competition in features that customers would actually care about, while also avoiding spending extra for features that would matter little to consumers. This would seem to be an insurmountable task. Fortunately, when examining the hardware of competing home consoles, Yumera came to the realization that they were, by and large, developed along the same lines as office computers and were not optimized for gameplay features such as background scrolling and character movement. He felt that Nintendo could design a machine that would sell for less but would still deliver a better gaming experience than contemporary machines. Working a series of 18-hour days, Yumera and his fellow engineers were able to refine a design down to the essentials required for delivering good gameplay and graphics at a competitive price point. The new system was based around the MOS 6502 processor, the exact same processor that powered the Apple II, Commodore 64, and the BBC Micro. It was a well-tested design that had been around since 1975 and could be made very cheaply. Ironically, it was also the processor at the heart of the Atari 2600 and its very poor graphics. But there were several reasons why Nintendo's new system, in spite of sharing the same processor as the 2600, would be capable of far better graphics. For starters, Nintendo chose to use the full 6502 rather than the scaled down version, the 6507, that the Atari 2600 used. Additionally, the 6502 would have other chips to assist it with specific tasks, such as generating the video display, and would have 16 times the RAM that the 2600 came with, with 2 kilobytes compared to mere 128 bytes. Nintendo also designed their new system now known as a Famicom, to be able to output up to 52 colors on the screen at once with up to 64 sprites on the screen, both numbers far in excess of the underpowered Atari 2600. Custom chips were used for this that took a lot of the load off the 6502, allowing it to focus on driving the other parts of the console. Nintendo's new Famicom system was launched in Japan in 1983 and saw steady success even though they missed Yamuchi's goal of selling the system for under 9,800 yen and instead were forced to sell it at 14,800 yen or about $179. The system only had three games upon its Japanese launch, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye, all of which were arcade ports. Still, the system offered superior graphics and gameplay to almost every other alternative in the Japanese market and for a considerably better price. The arcade graphics also converted well over to the powerful Famicom, something extremely unusual for the time. Most arcade ports up to that point had been at best like the 1982 Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man, a disappointing experience overall that fell far short of the arcade original both gameplay and graphics. At the start, Nintendo faced a serious problem when a major bug was discovered in the chip in the initial units that could cause the Famicom to crash right in the middle of the gameplay. Rather than try to cover it up or only fix units that customers returned, 
Nintendo chose instead to do an expensive recall of all Famicoms, both ones that had been sold and the ones still on the store shelves. They also didn't just replace the faulty chip, but rather put an entire new motherboard in every unit. The trust this gave them both from the stores and the Japanese consumer was immeasurable, and by the end of 1984, the Famicom was the best-selling game console in Japan. But the big money was the American mark. Nintendo wondered if their success in Japan would translate to a product that Americans would be interested in buying. The odds would seem to be against them, but Nintendo was determined to overcome them. However, they did not do this by making a big flashy entrance, but by rather adopting a more incremental approach that could best be described as a stealth launch. Nintendo started very cautiously by introducing the advanced video system at the 1985 Winter Consumer Electronics Show. The advanced video system was nothing more than a repackaged Famicom system, and as Arcaro expected, it attracted very little interest with the retailers. However, it did attract the attention of a savvy marketing man named Sam Bronfsky. Sam Bronfsky headed a sales and marketing company, Bronfsky & Associates, that had been at the front of the video game boom in the late 70s and early 80s. Sam immediately saw the potential in the AVS and went to work on Akawa to get him to launch the Famicom in the US. Both of them carefully analyzed the failures that caused the video game crash and how Nintendo would avoid these pitfalls. They came up with a strategy that played to Nintendo's strengths as a company, as well as the new system's strengths in gameplay, graphics, and price. The advanced video system was also renamed to the Nintendo Entertainment System, which Nintendo felt was a friendly name and did not immediately bring to mind what it was, a home console. Seeking to disguise the NES's game console qualities further, Nintendo tried a tactic of packaging the NES with a toy robot that could interact with games designed for it, as sort of an AI player too. However, Rob only worked with two of the games, Gyromite and Stack'em Up, both of which were mediocre. Nintendo focused solely on the New York City market in 1985 and sold to individual toy stores. These retailers, of course, were reluctant to try a new system, but Nintendo won them over with the promise that any unsold inventory could be returned for a full refund. This was an unheard of concession at the time. Nintendo got their system in front of plenty of customers where its gameplay graphics and the price could be counted on to peak interest. It was essentially a no-risk deal for the retailers. Nintendo's Rob Gambit was not a success as the toy retailers easily saw through the packaging ploy, but they still responded well to Nintendo's no-risk tactic, allowing them to return all unsold inventory for a full refund. By limiting the release area to New York City, Nintendo also made sure they maximized Brofonsky's sales and marketing team by letting them focus their efforts in one city. Nintendo also correctly realized that a console was only as valuable as the games that could be played on it, and that a large part of this was the quality of the titles, not the quantity. The Atari had boasted a massive library of low-quality games that had flooded the market, leaving good titles to struggle for attention and depressing the overall price that a title could be sold for. In light of this, Nintendo decided to focus on quality over quantity, which started by putting a lockout chip in every cartridge, without which the NES would refuse to play the game. This lockout chip could only be obtained through Nintendo, who also produced the cartridges. Game companies could only release a limited amount of titles per year, typically no more than five. These titles would have to pass Nintendo's quality assurance process as well, in order to earn a golden seal of quality on the game box. Failing to do so would mean no lockout chip, which would mean no legal release. It was a strategy that would earn Nintendo the ire of many game developers, but which would also ensure a steady stream of high quality titles instead of a torrent of low quality ones. The time delay between the Japanese and American launches also enabled the NES to release with 17 titles in its library, a library that included such all-time greats as Super Mario Bros., Excited Bike, and Ice Climbers. 17 Games also compares favorably to the launch lineup for the Xbox 360, which had 18 games at launch, and is considerably higher than the future Nintendo 64's launch lineup, which was a mere three games. The NES launch lineup had something for everyone, including sports games, and many of these initial launch games still hold up very well today. Nintendo's focus on quality software helped ensure that Nintendo made customers into repeat customers. Another tactic Nintendo used was to carefully allocate product to the stores. Instead of taking massive orders and then having the retailers return unsold product, Nintendo limited orders to ensure retailers' inventories remained manageable. Despite general retailer skepticism, Nintendo had modest but meaningful success 
with sales of 50,000 units across the entire New York City market. This was enough to expand the test market into Los Angeles, which also was a success. 1986 was the NES's big breakthrough though, when the new Super Mario game was bundled with the system causing sales to explode to over 3 million units and placing Nintendo well on its way to market dominance. Nintendo didn't rest upon its laurels but continued to follow their game strategy of focusing on high quality over quantity. Titanic franchises such as Metroid and The Legend of Zelda saw their initial release during this period and were all very well received. The Legend of Zelda in particular was notable for, among other things, including a built-in battery with every cartridge that allowed for game saves, something no other home console had ever done before. These game series would go on to be pillars of the gaming world and spawn multi-decade franchises. The end result was that the NES went on to dominate the console market in the 1980s, at one point having reached a market share of 90% in the United States. By the end of its production run, it had sold approximately 62 million units. Nintendo had succeeded against the odds and established the video game console market in North America. Mario and other Nintendo characters started to appear in all sorts of licensed products, while the world Nintendo became synonymous with video games. However, this success did not pass unnoticed. Back in Japan, another company was hungrily eyeing Nintendo's profits and preparing to challenge them and Nintendo's own policies that had done so much to propel them to market domination, reinvigorating the morebound gaming console market in the process, were about to spawn a powerful rival. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing.